so hey Mark, where can we find these little sheets? I have some sheets. Uh, if you need them for handouts to take notes on, but we're not gonna do this sermon. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody need it to their notes at all? Anybody want one of these pictures? You can take it on the back if you want. Yeah, we'll do this one another day. Anybody else need a piece of paper? Good. Uh, so, yeah, this, this week uh, I've been preparing to continue our series of Sermon on the Mount. Got a handout for you. We, we'll, we'll get to it another day. Um, this morning, I, I felt like God was changing the sermon and wasn't sure. This started about an hour and a half ago, and then it kind of was confirmed. So, uh, bear with me because I have no idea exactly where all this is going to go. Um, in Israel, one of the my favorite. You, most of you know this because I've said this in here before, even, but. Um, I was told the very first time I went to Israel, I remember I met, I'd never, I'd met Ray Vanderlaan before we went, but in, in, in Chicago, I really got to talk to him. And I, I just, we were talking and I said something and he said, I'll tell you this, he said, from experience, all these trips I leave to Israel, almost every time when I come back, I'll ask people what their favorite spot in Israel, or what their favorite day is. And he said, it's amazing, it's almost unanimous that people look at the days in the desert and say that was my favorite time because I learned more about God in my days in the desert than at any other time. And so so the way whenever I do a trip, I kind of do it semi the same way where we spend the first three days essentially, well, a couple days there in the desert early on. And uh, and so anyway, uh, one of the things that, that, that we talk about there, I want to kind of share with you this morning because I think it might help us in the season we're in. Uh, bear with me though because I have not spent a lot of time preparing on this lesson uh, but but it's one of those that has impacted me as I've dug into it and studied it and I just think we're in a season we need it Deuteronomy 32 Deuteronomy 32 we're going to look at verses, verses 10 and 11 is where we're going to start and here's what Deuteronomy 32 says says this, he found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of a wilderness. He encircled him, he cared for him, he guarded him as the pupil of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spread his wings and caught them, and he carried them on his pinions. Pray with me. One more time as we start the lesson. God, I thank you that when we're in our deserts, when we're in a hard time, you're there with us. God, that, that you stretch out your wings to shade us. You pick us up in your arms and you carry us, God. That's who you are. And I just pray this morning. As we walk through these hard seasons of life, God, that, that we would learn to what it looks like to just rest in your arms, knowing that the battle belongs to you as we've sung. It's not about us. It's not about what we bring to the table. It's not a, it, this is about you, God, and help us to rest in you this morning. God, I just pray for your words this morning. Give us what we need. Give us our daily manna. In Jesus' name, amen. So Deuteronomy 32 starts out, he found them in this desert land. And, and, and God found Israel. So this, this is about Israel, okay? This is about Israel. It says God found Israel in this, this desert land. The, the Hebrew, the, you may, and then the second, the second, and in the howling waste, or the, the, the wasteland, your Bible, the Bible might say. That word is tohu, by the way, which is how the entire Bible starts in Genesis 1 is with tohu vavohu. 
Okay, so tohu is this utter chaos before God spoke into it. So God found Israel in this, this wasteland, this tohu. Now, what is tohu? What a wasteland is something that doesn't produce. If you go to a desert, you see there's not much alive there. I mean, it's if Israel's desert is rocks. I don't know what I mean, that's. That's the thing that that probably impacted me that I wasn't expecting when I went to. I knew we were going to spend the first two or three days in the desert on my first trip, and I was thinking, okay, we got Arizona, or I've never been to Arizona desert. I don't know, but I was thinking sandy, you know. And then you get there, and it's like. Oh my goodness, this is rocks upon rocks upon rocks upon rocks. I'm like, this isn't what I pictured for the desert. But it, you know what? No matter what desert you're in, nothing grows there. Nothing, nothing's produced. There are no humans that live there. And that's true in Jesus' day in Israel in the desert. And it's true today in the same spot. There's still, even with our technology, there's nobody living there. Not nobody. Now, dry and hot is what I think of when... when and, and I think that's God's picture he says, when you're going, and we're going to see this through a few other texts, when you're going through hard times, the metaphor in the Bible for the hard times, and this is what God brought Israel back to over and over, was desert. Where I have nowhere to turn, there's no water, there's no food, God, you have to come through right here. I can't do it. I can't rely on my strength. I can't rely on me. And, and so desert became this image in the Bible of when things aren't going the way you think they should. It's bitter being in Tohu. And I have a feeling we could go around the room and talk about times where we were all in just this chaos, right? My mind goes back to, I've shared this before, just I, I'll never forget the day I found out my mom had cancer. And... Uh, my, so my brother's a radiologist. Um, my mom went to get, she was having this cough in like late April. Um, uh, and this was 2009. Late April, she has this cough. Well, she went to the doctor. They thought it was a little bit of like bronchitis or something. Gave her some medicine. She went back home. It didn't get better. A couple weeks later, she goes back in. They put her on a stronger medicine. Still didn't get better. She went back. They did an x-ray the second time. They said, oh, you do. You have pneumonia. So this, this proves we have pneumonia. She's like, oh, okay. Well, it still didn't get better. She got a CT scan. And before it was read, she got the CD and she overnighted it to my, my brother, who at the time was somewhere. I don't know. He travels too much. I can't remember where he was at the time. But anyway, she overnighted it to him to read it. And... The next day I'm working, and it's it's uh, almost before lunchtime, and I get a call from my brother, which which he doesn't call me during the day typically. That that was odd, and so I you know I, I'm between patients essentially, and I answer my phone, and he said, Mark, are you sitting down? I'm like, oh, this is not good. And he said, he said, Mama has stage four cancer, just out of nowhere, because I mean she was. Like I said, she, she was, she's never smoked. She's had just lung cancer, but she's never smoked, never had, she's healthy, very healthy. And within seven months, she passed away. And, and I say that to say, that was a season of chaos for me. But you know, I, what, and I, I'd ask you this, what has been your season of chaos? Maybe some of you are experiencing right now. Maybe if you, some of you can think of things like that in your past. That, that you you had that was just chaos. And like, this isn't the way things are supposed to be. Listen to how the Bible describes those moments. Psalm 32, 4 says this. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. You see this, this desert imagery. This is the psalmist saying... When I was going through my hard times, I felt like I was in the middle of summer and I had nowhere to turn. That, that's what you feel like when you're in the desert. When we're in Israel and it's 120 degrees sometimes and it is so hot and you're sweating and you haven't even got off the bus yet. And, it is, and you're like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. That's exactly what the Bible talks about is, is the imagery for what, what we go through. The sun never – the other thing about the desert – there's no clouds ever. 
Like I have never seen a cloud. I don't remember anyway in the desert in Israel, and I don't. I, I think Arizona. I've never been to Arizona in some of those deserts, but from what I understand, it's pretty much sun all the time. There's not a whole lot of clouds, and 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 that is the imagery of the psalmist. Of oh my goodness, when when times were tough, I just felt like the heat was bearing down on me. You know, I just thought about man. I uh, knew my kids wouldn't even remember my mom. That was hard. That was hard. So we've all been through that. We don't have to go around and share. This isn't that, but I just want you thinking about those times in your life where you've had desert. Okay? The good news is God provides in the desert. Psalm 17. Turn to Psalm 17 with me. We're going to look at a few verses here. Psalm 17, starting in verse 6. Here's what it says. This is David. I have called upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my speech. Wondrously show your loving kindness, O Savior, of those who take refuge in your right hand, from those who rise up against them. Verse 8. Keep me as the apple of your eye and hide me in the shadow of your wings. This is one of those things that when I learned this imagery, because we don't know Hebrew. But when you understand the word for shadow, the word, the word for wing is the word for shadow. It's the same word, cell. Okay, cell is shadow. Okay, so this thing is, kind of goes back to our vision in Deuteronomy 2, that God has these wings that he shields us from the sun. And in the desert, you don't get much shade, right? And so God knows what he's doing. The psalmist says, God, please put your shadow out for me. Put your wings out. Shadow me, God, so that this heat doesn't continue to bear down. And, and one of the things in the desert, I remember whenever I, the very first trip, one specific hike, it is a long hike. And we started early that morning, and it was already hot. And we start hiking, and the, and the hard part with the hike is, especially in Israel, you're hiking in wadis, which are dry riverbeds. You can't see very far. They kind of do this right here, just like rivers here do. But they're dry beds, and so I don't know what's around that bend. I have no idea how far we're hiking today. Some days he'd say, bring four liter bottles of water with you in your backpack. And you're thinking, this is going to be a long hike. If you want me to bring four of those big leader bottles, and he'd remind us all the time, drink, 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 drink. But the thing about that is we're hiking. You have no shade ever unless you find a cliff and you get under that cliff or unless you find a little, they call them root tree. And we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, But that is the desert. And God, uh, David is praying here, God, I need you to give me some shade. Right? I need you to give me some shade. Now, here's what you need. I've, sh I've shared this before. Again, I did not ever, ever get this until I went to Israel the first time. The wise in Israel, the way they are, okay, they go along with the same way the sun goes up and down, or east to west, because the mountains run north and south. So every wadi in Israel, Israel is north, is, is east to west. So the sun goes this way. Okay, so when you're hiking down some of these wadis, okay, guess what? You have no shade whatsoever. So we get to the book of Exodus, and it says in the book of Exodus, when he was leading him in the desert, they're going down these wadis, he showed up as a what by day? Cloud. Yeah, cloud. Why would he show up as a cloud? He was their shade. And then at night... In the desert, I'm telling you, you've been in the hot sun all day, you've been baking, and then it gets cool at night. Guess what happens when you have a sunburn and then it's cool at night? You freeze. And so at night, he is a pillar of fire to help keep them warm. So God's meeting them, meeting their very needs, not just so they can see where to go, but he's also meeting their needs as he does that. So God provides shade in the desert. My question to you. That hard chaos time you've been through, what was your shame? I'll tell you what mine was. 
My mom was diagnosed first off those seven months. I don't know if, I don't know that I've ever seen a community come around somebody like they did in McKenzie. <laughs> My mom was really well taken care of. People brought food by people. They started, they have a little McKenzie um, bank there, McKenzie Bank and Trust. It's like on the corner at McKenzie. It's right there on their billboard. I'll never forget this. I drove by and it, it had come inside to help give to Betsy, a sense of my mom. And people would just stop by and give them. My shade was people, right? My shade was people came alongside. And then we, we get to get to the funeral. And I, it, it's before we're even letting people in. The first person that came what came from hours away. Shade. God provides shade when we're in our desert. And I will tell you, it's almost always in the form of other people. Turn to Psalm 121, verse 4 through 6. Love this. I love this image. Love this image. Here's what it says. The Lord is your keeper. Excuse me. Start verse 4. Behold, he, who's, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil and he will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. If you take your hand and you stick your right hand as far out as you can, the, it, the Bible says God is never farther away from you than this. He is the shade at your right hand, right? He is never farther away from you than this right here. Look at verse 5 again. It says, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. Go back to this image that he's trying to get through to these people that understand the desert. Okay, they've hiked in the desert. They know that they need him to shade. Then I told you a minute ago, the number one thing that you look for is shade in the desert is something called a rotum tree. It's a broom tree. Now, when I say find a shade tree, out here, there's a big old tree right behind us here. I remember, uh, I remember when... <laughs> We were talking about doing the, the baptism with Neely. I thought, well, we could put that maybe under the tree. That way, if it's warm, this is before we knew what the temperature was going to be. But, uh, you know, then you'd have some shade, you know. And I was, but, but our trees are like these big oak trees sometimes we think about as shade trees. That's not a rotum tree. What the Bible says, you know, that, that, that God provides these broom trees, these rotum trees. Man, I wish I could. You, come with me, please, next summer so I can show you. Because this, this is another image that when you see, you'll never forget. A broom tree in the desert, they're small little weepy trees. They're little bitty trees. And a lot of times if you're hiking down a wadi, I've got a spot next summer that I'm going to take our group that's more of a wadi. And they have these, these broom trees. And whenever we were hiking one of these wadis, we stopped one time. And... Instinctively, two of the 18-year-olds were smarter than the rest of us because they there's a little bitty tree and they went up and they was on the hillside and they kind of sat like right underneath it. It was a broom tree. And they say that it's 10 to 15 degrees cooler in the desert under a broom tree. But the problem is they're not big. So a broom tree, most broom trees, you can only fit like your head and upper body under. Your feet are still going to be out in the sun. It doesn't even cover your whole body. I've got pictures. I wish I had a way to show you these. Of course, this wouldn't have worked out this morning anyway because I didn't know I was doing this. But I love broom trees because it's a picture of what God provides as far as shade goes. 
Like, so often, I have no idea if this is even in my notes, but so often we pray the prayer. Listen to me. I've prayed this prayer a thousand times. I pray the prayer, God, get me out of this desert. Somehow, supernaturally, take me out of this desert. I want air conditioning. I want, take me back to where it's 75 and there's no, and I just I can just bask in comfort. But that's not what we see God do in, in the Bible so often, right? God provides just enough shade so that they can keep going. He provides just enough shade so they can keep doing where, and so I say, I say that to say, if I never go through a desert, there are things about God I'll never know. And I hate to say that, but most of you can probably have the same testimony as me as I learned more about how God can comfort. When I went through that with my mom, I, I know that he comforts. I know it. I'm not guessing. I know that he comforts. Many of you do too because you've been through things where you cry out to God that, God, I need you right now. It is hot. I don't know where to go. I have... You have to come through, God, and then he does. And all of a sudden, you have a testimony to say God is a God of comfort, and then he wants you to use that testimony when others are going through it, right? That is the God who comforts. So sometimes when we pray, God, get me out of this desert, that is the last thing that we need. We miss the blessing of him teaching us if he pulls us out of the desert. We miss what he has for us. Now, I'm not, say, I'm not saying don't pray for miracles. Not, hear me say that because I think God is a God who is a healer. I'm saying, though, in the middle of whatever you go through, understand God's with you. And God wants more than anything. God, God wants to show you who he is. Man, I can't wait till we get to heaven. And we don't have to deal with so much stuff here. How awesome is that going to be? If y'all are with me, I won't have to change my sermon at the last second to go through other things. We can just keep moving along. I don't know. I think we'll be letting Jesus teach us, not me. But uh, what I'm saying is, I can't wait. I can't wait. But right now, while he has us here, I don't want us to miss what he's doing either. I don't want us, I don't want to miss also what he wants us to be. And that's what we're going to talk about in a minute. But here, here's the other thing. Um, there are examples in the desert of, of uh, in the in the Bible of people going and sitting under broom trees. Did you know that? Hagar walked out in the desert in South Israel. Her child was dying of thirst, and the child was ten to twelve years old. And she says the Bible says she laid him under a rotom tree to die. And she walked out as far so that she didn't have to hear the scream, thinking that that was the end. Elijah, remember the, the big confrontation at Mount Carmel, right? This big, this big challenge at Mount Carmel. And the Bible says that he fled way down south in Israel after that in the desert. The contest didn't convince anybody of what he thought it would, right? And Elijah decided to quit. He was done. At that moment, Elijah was done. And it says in the Bible, he set under a broom tree, thinking this is it. He was ready to die. And I want you to see, the broom tree is this image of, of God. He uses it multiple times to say, oh, no, no, no. I'm still here. I'm still going to provide shade. And I'm still in control. Now, if you have a shade, if, if it was a bright, sunny day, and all you have to shift you is your right hand, how much shade does that really provide? Just think about it. If he's the shade of our right hand, maybe it'll help a little bit if I just hold it up there. Maybe my head can stay a little bit cooler, right? That's that's kind of the image of if you if you do that. I think God a lot of times gives us just enough shade to help us keep going. Just like when we're in that wadi, there are times where we had somebody get overheated and we would stop. I have pictures that we would hold stuff over them. And put ice wrap or cold water around their neck and stuff. And, and we're fanning them. And we're just trying to provide just enough shade. We're going to keep going in the desert. We're not giving up. But that's what God does. He gives us just enough shade so that we can keep going. 
So think about your desert, because that, that's my story. I mean, my honest prayer, I still have emails that I sent out to people when I found out my mom had cancer. Because my honest heart plea was, God, please do something right here. But sometimes God gives us just enough shade in his providence. And I'm telling you now, he wants to use us as that shade. He gives us broom trees, and I think we're the answer to the prayer of God I need you to give me some shade. Turn to Isaiah 25. You see a couple more verses. Isaiah 25. Look at verse 4 and 5 with me. For you have been a defense for the helpless. A defense for the needy in distress. A refuge and a storm. And a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a rainstorm against a wall. Like heat and drought. You subdue the uproar of aliens. Like heat by the shadow of a cloud. The song of the ruthless is silenced. So so if you're talking about these people in this verse that are helpless. Okay, the, 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 the Hebrew word means someone that's weak or poor, someone who just, they're helpless. They don't, they, they don't have anybody to help them. They need God to come through. If you look at the imagery of the Bible, the imagery is they are people that are in the desert, right? They don't have anywhere to turn. They don't have any way to, to keep going without God coming through. And that's why he's talking about their, he is shade, he is shade from the heat because they're in a desert is the, is the imagery. God's their broom tree. Turn with me a few pages. Isaiah 32. This is Isaiah 32 is one of those things. I want you to see this. If you've never heard this before, this is what I pray often when I hear that people are going through stuff. This is Isaiah 32 is what I pray personally. Isaiah 32. Look at verses 1 and 2 starting out there. Behold, a king will reign righteously and princes will rule justly. Each will be like a refuge from the wind, a shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry country, like the shade of a huge rock in a parched land. Stop right there for a second. Think about this when when it's written. So just think about there's been lots of kings as we get to the book of Isaiah. Right. There's been lots of kings. Uh, Some were good. The Bible says not many. Most were not good. Right. But they know kings. We, we don't have kings here, uh, at least not like this. Now, lots of kings at their time. This is about the king that's the Messiah. Okay, that's the context. Behold, a king will reign righteously. Not like all these bad kings we've been experiencing. We're going to have King Messiah come. And what will happen when this King Messiah comes? It says, it says this. First, each... Will be like a refuge from the storm. But each, it says, will be like a shade of a huge rock in a parched land. So the Bible says that when Jesus comes, you got to get this imagery. When Jesus comes, each, all the followers in his kingdom, all of us who are believers who follow Jesus, will be like a shade, a huge rock in a parched land. And the image is the desert. The only place in a wadi you might get relief other than a root tree is if, the, if there's the cliff of the rocks coming out. And sometimes, sometimes there was a few feet of shade and we would all try to get right under it, right? And that's precisely where RVL would stop and teach usually and you would see every, all of us, oh, here's a little bit of shade and we'd try to get under it. And, he's, and what this Isaiah 32 is saying is... When the Messiah comes, you will know it because all of his followers are going to be broom trees. That doesn't take the desert away. That doesn't make the air conditioner come on and it come down to 75 in their lives. But it gives them just enough shade where they can keep going. Just enough shade where they can keep going. And like I said... For me, I still remember all those people that were shade to me in my day. And I know I'm not unique there. I know there's a lot of you that could share the same thing. So 
that's, that's the lesson of the broom tree. That's the lesson of the desert. Now, I don't like, here's the other thing you've got to understand. The desert's really not fun to be in. I told you I liked going to the desert in Israel. It's not because it's a wonderful place. And next to Disney World, it's like, wow. It's not, it's not about the, the rides. Okay, it's not, it's not why you go to the desert. But I will say this. In the desert, you learn more about God than in other places. And I don't like being there because it's hot. I'd rather be somewhere else. But do you understand for you to be a broom tree in someone's desert, do you know what that means? You better be willing to go into their desert. And that's not fun. But when somebody's going through a hard time, our job, if we're going to be Isaiah 32 believers, is we have to be willing to go into their desert and sit with them. And encourage him. Look at Isaiah 32, 3 and 4. Then the eyes of those who see will not be blinded. And the ears of those who hear will listen. The mind of the hasty will discern the truth. And the tongue of the stammerers will hasten to speak clearly. God promises that when we're a broom tree. When we are what he's called us to be in a dry and parched land, in a desert, where there's all kinds of people in deserts right now. There's all kinds of people around this block who are in their deserts right now. I can guarantee you. When we are who God calls us to be, he says, you know what? That's when eyes are going to be opened. That's going to be when ears, they'll be unstopped. That's when people will see God. It's when we are who we are supposed to be. And we're broom trees. So my question is this. When we grow up a lot of times when we're little, we, we have these grand things that we want to do all these amazing things. And we want to be president. We want to, do, we want to be doctors that fix everybody. We want to do, do you want to truly change the world? And you can say, oh yeah, I do. I want, I want my life to matter. I want to be what God calls me to be. And I hope that your hearts pl- cry. You don't have to be Billy Graham Crusaders. The Bible says ears will be opened. Eyes will be opened. People will see God if you simply meet people in their desert, in their hard time. If, if you just simply do that and you're there with them and you're a broom tree, it opens the eyes of the blind. That's who we're called to be. That's who we're called to be. And the rabbis taught, at the time of Jesus, we have this in writing. The only way you're going to be a broom tree is if you've been in that spot where you needed a broom tree. Unless you experience the shade of someone else when you went through your desert, you're never going to be motivated to be that broom tree of somebody else. Because nobody wants to be in desert. Nobody. Like I said, to this very day, if you drive in South Israel, even with all our technologies, you'll look around. It's the exact same as when Jesus was there because there's nobody there. None. Zero. No life. Nobody wants to live in desert. But when you experience that shade, you can't help but want to provide that to others. Now, turn to Psalm 26. This is where we're going to finish. Psalm 26. Psalm 26, verse 2. Examine me, O Lord. Try me. Test my mind and my heart. These are the words of David. Now, this is one of those prayers that I would ask. Is that prayer that you would want to pray to God? God, please examine me. Test me. Try me. Because, see, we can come in here saying we, we want to be people of Isaiah 32 that, that, that are broom trees. But you know what that means? God's going to give us a chance to put it into practice. And I think he is right now. See, we want green pastures. We want lush lands. We want cooler temperatures of Galilee. 
And God says, no, if you want to be mine, I'm going to take you into the desert. I want you to be a broom tree of people that are hurting. And when you do that, people are going to know me. So do you want people to know God? Do you want people to see him at work? Well, if you do, the answer is be a broom tree. Look for those that are hurting. Join them in their desert and let God use you. I don't know what that looks like, guys. It's hard. In this season we're in, we've got hurting families around us, even in our midst. And God says, Grace Fellowship, here's your chance. Here's your chance to be a broom tree. You say you want the world to see me. You say you want me to put me on display. Here's your chance. I think the answer is we walk by the Spirit. Allowing Him to direct our steps. Not, I mean, I, I don't know what God's going to call you to do in the midst of all of this. Even outside our church family, there are people in each of our lives that are hurting, that are in deserts. This week, how can you be a broom tree? We're going to pray. Guys, this is, I know we don't have an altar. This is your chance to respond, though, okay? I'm always, I love praying with people. If you have anything I can pray with you about, know that at the end of every service, please come up. I'd love to pray with you. I don't think I'm that intimidating. If you ever have anything, though, then text me, email me. If there's anything that we can be praying for, God is a God who hears. He's a God who hears our prayers, especially when we truly cry out to him. And then also, guys, let's be desert people who are shade to one another. Pray with me, God. I thank you so much that we're not alone when we go through hard times. God, that at the end of the day, you are our shade. But God, then you invite us into that and allow us to also share in that shade with you. I, I know we all have moments that we can be broom trees this week and even today. Help us to be what you called us to be. Not for our sake, God, for yours, so that eyes will be opened, ears will be unplugged. And people will see you. May this be what happens, God, as we are shade to those that you put in our path. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.